Hey everyone, my name is Mark. Uh, welcome to another webisode with a couple of foreign chapter, the Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, and today with me is the noted author, Ginny Steibold. She's doing a run with us. So this is, I believe, her fifth or sixth episode with us. And this is my 34th webisode. And Ginny will be presenting on carnivorous plants. She has a master's in botany from the University of Maryland and is the author of books such as Step-by-Step -Step Guide to a Florida Native Yard that can be purchased on Amazon or University Press of Florida. A uh, couple of furnace celebrating its 10 year anniversary. This is a watershed moment for us. Please consider donating to our outreach. Every little bit helps. Uh, better yet, consider becoming a Florida Native Plant Society member today. It's the ultimate show of your love and support. So we have special experiences and other offers lined up uh, for this moment in our history. And to top it off, uh, we are just voted the outstanding chapter of the year by the Florida Native Plant Society. It's super exciting for me personally. Uh, and now back to Ginny's exciting presentation. So Ginny, would you like to introduce yourself and take over? Oh, sure. Thanks very much, Mark. And congratulations on your, on your anniversary. Um, and I would like to urge everyone who is listening or watching to join us at FNPS um, because uh, it's, it's important. We're doing important work. We have property that we own to preserve uh, special plants and there are all kinds of things going on. So our work doesn't stop even though other things have. Okay, so this presentation on carnivorous plants I developed for a Northern Atlantic cruise assignment for this summer, and the cruise has been canceled. So I wanted to talk to the cruisers about peat bogs, but uh, and I also was going to talk to them about oceans and um, the flora and fauna of Eastern Canada and Iceland. So I had a number of presentations done. Um, but this one, um, I think I needed something more dynamic than uh, or attractive than peat bogs because nobody would come for that. So that's why the carnivorous plants are the more compelling headliner. So I'm not going to give it the summer. So this is the world premiere of this particular uh, presentation. So let's get started. Okay, I shared my screen. Can you see it, Mark? No, okay. I can't. Not yet. Okay. This is what I see. I see it on my computer. But if we can't, we'll go back to the old, the old fashioned way. It looks like it's being shared. No? Oh, well. Can you see it? Okay, I'm going to hit escape, try to stop this. I cannot. I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, it didn't work. Okay, so uh, you have the PDF file. I can't I see any. Yeah, I can't see anything except my presentation now. So that part didn't okay. work. All right, no problem. I got you. But I can't see what you're doing either. So. <laughs> and there is your presentation. I have I it up on yeah, my, I, so I'll I, wait I, until you escape yeah. out of your. Yeah, it's not allowing me to escape. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Have to be flexible. 
All right, so here is a, far, a famous carnivorous plant, Audrey from the Little Shop of Horrors. And as we'll see, the non-fictional carnivorous plants are a bit different, but I think they're just as interesting. See, see if you agree with me on this. So in the next slide, um, I talk about, um, I'll talk about peat in general, bogs and bog ecology. Um, and so that um, that is what I wanted to talk to the cruisers about. Um, and then we'll go get into some of the carnivorous plants. So we'll, we'll do picture plants, we'll do sundews, Venus flytraps, bladder warts, butter warts, and corkscrew plants. And the conundrum for carnivorous plants is that they need to augment their nutrition with the bugs, um, but they also want their pollinators to be successful. So they want their pollinators to live and they want their prey to die. So it's an interesting way that they have um, figured out how to do that. All right, so on the next slide, we'll look at peat. And peat is partially decomposed organic matter. They're dead plants and animals and their waste. And it's formed in soil with little or no oxygen. So this condition is called hypoxia. Now in regular soil, the organic materials decompose relatively quickly. But with peat, since there's a lack of oxygen, it's missing the soil microbes that would normally digest the organic matter uh, relatively quickly. But peat forms slowly and may build up over uh, thousands of years, which means that peat sequesters carbon on a long-term basis. Now, when I was doing the research for my climate-wise landscaping uh, book, I wrote the chapter on soil. And in my research, I found that soil sequesters four times more carbon than all the terrestrial plants. So soil is the big uh, carbon sink. Um, in, so even more than all the rainforests and all the other plants, soil is the big player in carbon sequestration on terrestrial um, situations. So the big reason for this disproportionate share is the peat um, sequesters a lot of carbon for a long time. Now, if we go to the next slide, peat, um, the peat um, is formed in a number of different areas. So this is, may be surprising. Look at all of these um, green areas. And also, um, we're going to start with the yellow areas, which are the salt marshes and wetlands. So they're around the coastline areas um, in various parts of the world. So we'll start with the salt marshes. So we go to the next slide. Now, salt marshes, and if you if you heard Marjorie's talk yesterday, she did an excellent job on living shorelines. Uh, she did a members only live and uh, live and learn, uh, lunch and learn, and um, she talked about the salt marshes and the mangroves, which we're going to talk about here. But if you're a member of the Native Plant Society, you'll be able to go back and listen to more detail from her excellent presentation yesterday. So, but the salt marshes are subjected to twice daily flooding and draining cycle of the tides, and they are populated mostly by certain grasses that can withstand both the salt and the flooding and draining. And because of the frequent wash of, of, of salt water, there's little or no oxygen in the soil, and that allows the peat to form. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, this gives you the carbon cycle in a salt marsh. And so the plants create the uh, carbon by photosynthesis and the, and the plant parts settle into the top of the soil in a detritus and it keeps storing there. And some 
carbon is given back as carbon dioxide and methane, but then also in the salt marshes, we quite often get hydrogen sulfide that's given off um, that gives the salt marshes that rotten egg smell in low tide, which is why so many people wanted to fill them up. But the salt marshes provide important protection for our coastal areas. And the salt marshes can increase their um, level along with the sea rises. And they have sediments as well as just the plant parts. So they, the soil builds up relatively quickly. Okay, if we go to the next one, the mangroves um, on the map here show as the horizontal lines in the various coastal areas. And so, of course, we have mangroves here in Florida, but the biggest diversity of mangroves is over in Indonesia and the, and the Southeast Asian uh, island uh, nations. They have 40 or 50 different types of mangrove over there. Well, in this hemisphere, we only have three or four. So we'd have much less diversity of our mangroves. So if we go to the next slide, um, the mangroves build up peat in a similar way to the salt marshes. They have the leaves and the detritus from the plants and the animals that live there. So they have the, often they have roots or pneumatophores that capture all of this stuff. And again, they have sediment coming in with the oceans. And, and um, depending upon uh, where they are, they again, they can rise with the sea level um, because of the sediments that come in. And because of how they live and reproduce, the mangrove forests can sequester carbon for much longer than other forests. Just e even tropical rainforests don't sequester the same amount of carbon as the mangroves. And if you look at Penacamp State Park mangroves here, they, for acres and acres and acres, all you see is mangroves. Um, so they don't get very tall, but their carbon sequestration is in the soil. Okay, so um, the next slide, please. So the mangroves build peat, and if the conditions are right, the peat can remain intact for thousands of years. The graph of this core on this slide was more than 30 feet deep until they hit uh, rock. It was about 10 meters. And at that depth, it was dated to more than 7,000 years ago. And so when we say that mangroves sequester peat, what is really happening is that there's the plants, the little fringe on the top, but all of the carbon that's sequestered in the peat is why they are better sequesterers than the rainforests. All right, so this particular core was taken uh, in Belize, which is on the Yucatan Peninsula, and it has, shares borders with Mexico and Guatemala. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, this is our map of peat areas again. There are some other areas that build up peat, such as pine barrens in New Jersey, and um, rainforests in both tropical and temperate rainforests, but mostly tropical rainforests do in some cases, not always, but in some cases, uh, peat um, is a big factor. In most of the rainforest, the soil is relatively thin, only a few inches thick. But in some areas, the peat goes very deep. There's some areas in the Amazon, and just in 2017, they discovered a peat bog in the rainforest in the Congo region that was um, the size of New York State. So they didn't even know about it before. Um, but for our topic today, we'll focus on the darker green areas at, in the more northerly regions where the mires make up more than 10% of the land and are mostly fens or bogs. So if we go to the next slide.
over hundreds of thousands of years, repeated glaciation sheared off the mountains and eroded the steep slopes, creating shallow basins and plains and flat bottom valleys where bogs can form. And these features provide the perfect conditions for wetland and bog formation. Now, other names for the, these bogs were uh, are, are uh, mires and quagmires and muskegs, and that's usually used in uh, Alaska, um, and fens. And most scientists think that most of the northerly peat bogs today were, were created about 10,000 years ago. Um, and this particular um, peat area is in Quebec, Canada, and in the distance you can see spruce trees where there is a little bit more height so that that height allows the spruce trees to live where they would not be able to live in the, in the bog. Okay, so let's start with fens. So if we go to the next, um, the next slide. Now fens unlike bogs, receive most of their water from streams and springs. So these um, sources of water mean that there are more nutrients and more minerals because when water flows over rocks, it dissolves the minerals and it may flow over soils and everything. So the fens have more nutrients than the bogs. And the fens are relatively diverse compared to the bogs. There'd be grasses, mostly grasses, some sedges, and, and some forbs, some flowering plants, um, and even some trees and shrubs. So the fen soil is called mineralotrophic because it has um, a, a number of minerals. So it, it is a fairly fertile soil. But bogs on the other hand, and if we go to the next slide, receive water from only precipitation, rain and snow. So these soils in the, in the bogs are called ombrotropic because uh, they're cloud fed. And many bogs begin as ponds or small lakes called kettle holes that were created when the glaciers up there began to retreat. And as we'll see, because they receive no minerals or other nutrients, because they only get the rain, they're nutrient poor and they become acidic. Okay, if we go to the next slide here. So what we'd have is the formation, they'd have kettle holes and they'd be lined with rock or clay. They'd be impermeable materials so that the water collects there. Now the plants that can survive in the low nutrient environment began to grow. And usually these plants are sphagnum mosses. And um, they produce, reproduce by spores, so there are spores everywhere um, because they're, they're th the, um, the air is thick with them. So they start coming out, growing into the water, and um, then it, more other plants would come with them, um, and eventually the water would be encapsulated as a lens underneath the, the peat. And if you walk on, on a bog where there's a lens of water underneath it, it's called a quaking bog because the feet, the earth moves under your feet. So as the peat makes it into more land-like, that's called terrestrialization. And once that starts, then the peat um, sort of, and the water ends up flowing out around out of the original kettle hole and that kills off the trees with too much acidity and too much water. And so that process is called pollutification. So, but in a bog, the formation of peat is very slow. It's not like five inches a year in a mangrove or in a salt marsh because those areas get sediments. It's a slow process in a bog so that the peat forms at about one millimeter per year. There's no sediments in these. So if we go to the next slide. 
Okay, so let's look at sphagnum moss. There's about 300 different species, but the differences between the species are so minute that you might need a microscope to key out these species. So we're just going to consider it as one big uh, group. Now, the sphagnums are uh, true mosses, and this is a non-vascular plant. As I said, it reproduces using spores, so it's non-flowering and non-vascular. And you probably have noticed in your hikes in the woods and stuff that um, the um, mosses, whether it be sphagnum moss or other mosses, never gets very tall, and that's because it doesn't have any xylem and phloem that the water needs to be able to flow freely in the plant because it doesn't have any vascular tissue. So it can't grow tall. So that's why mosses are short. But if we go to the next uh, slide, because in the leaves, there's two types of cells in the leaves. There's the um, living leaves called chlorophyllous cells, and that's where the, that's where the uh, photosynthesis takes place. And then in the middle of the leaf are structural cells. They're structurally dead cells. They're called hyaline cells, and this is where the water is stored. And so, and so this um, is advantageous to the plant because it stores water so if the water level goes down it has plenty of water but then it also um, it also means that when the sphagnum moss is dead that it can absorb the um, water in the those old structural cells so um, let's go to the next slide all right and Because of its abundance in northern Eurasia, peoples, ancient peoples, relied on it for many uses, especially burning it as a fuel because in that region, there, there are, trees are not very common. And this has continued for centuries. But once a peat bog has been har harvested or begun to have been harvested, the vegetation and the hydrology changes. And so this photo shows an extraction of peat. Those are all those brown uh, rectangles there. Um, and and um, they've been collected and they'll dry out there. Um, and this was a blanket bog in Scotland. And so this old bog is no longer a mire. It will not create new peat. So they're harvesting it from a former bog. But as people extracted peat over the centuries, sometimes they, sometimes they found surprises. So if we go to the next slide. Sometimes they found bog bodies. And because of the nature of peat, because it is sterile and antiseptic, the skin and the hair of these people did not decompose because all of the soil microbes are missing. However, the bones dissolved because this is so acidic. And so these bodies have been brought into museums around the world. So the Toland man is one of the more famous and they've dated his tissues and he died in the fourth century BC. And so they discovered him in a Danish bog in 1950. So he's on display now. He has a noose around his neck. So some of them. And the harvesters of peat also sometimes find globs of butter in the peat that ancient people put there, probably because there was no refrigeration, and maybe to protect it as an asset. And then they lost track of it. OK, so. Um, Today, the peat harvesting continues, so if you continue to the next slide. Both in Canada and in uh, northern Eurasia. But however it's harvested, whether it's harvested by machine or by hand, 
it's still way faster than the peat can form because, again, it forms at only one millimeter per year. So harvesting peat is never sustainable. It's never sustainable. So, but there were and are a number of, of uses for peat moss if we go to the next the next uh, slide. Um, and because of the high aligned cells in the dried peat, it burns evenly. And because of those cells, there's air spaces in there. So it burns quite well. And it was used for fuel in ancient times and even today in some parts of the world. Plus, whole peat bogs can burn. And, it's, and wildfires in the Arctic are becoming more common. And when it gets too hot and too dry, then the whole peat on the soil can burn. So they can burn for months. So the global uh, warming is not good for these peat bogs. It's not good for the earth because all that carbon is then released. But peat fires, controlled peat fires, are essential for one iconic product from Scotland. So if you go to the next slide, it's Scotch whiskey. And Scotch whiskey is distilled from peated malt. Now, what the heck is <laughs> what the heck is peated malt? So if we go to the next slide, um, malt is a germinate a grain that's been germinated and then killed by uh, being heated or dried. So in the case of scotch, they use barley. They force it to germinate by soaking it in water. And then when they heat it and dry it, they use peat fire and peat smoke to stop the growth of the germinated barley. And that is called malt. So there's barley malt, there's other kinds of malt, but basically it's a germinating grain that, that is stopped. Okay, okay, so then the scotch is made from fermenting the malt and then distilling it. And other whiskeys can be, you, can be you made from peated malt, but they can't be called scotch unless they're distilled in Scotland. So there's your liquor trivia for the day. All right, and on the next slide, peat was also very important in World War I. All right, now because of its extreme acidity, the peat is sterile and antiseptic. And because of the hyaline cells, it's very absorbent, as, as we know. So it was widely available in Northern Europe. So in 1916, during World War I, the Red Cross created field dressing packs using peat moss. And each pack contained two bags of peat, and they were sewn into the soldiers' uniforms. So this way, the soldiers could apply these sterile dressings with all of the instructions on the outside of the bag um, to stave the the. Uh, blood and and sterilize the wound by these dressings. So it made a huge difference in the survival rate of wounded soldiers in World War I. But after the war, all those women who made the, no, keep it there, keep it, all those women who made the pads for the field dressings redesigned them somewhat for their own uses. And so the first sanitary napkins used peat as the absorbent material. And in those days, in the early 1900s, they could not advertise any, they couldn't hint any reason what you would use this for. So they had a drawing of a Red Cross lady on the, on the box and the women would have to figure out themselves what the heck these pads were for. And so these were the first sanitary napkins. Okay, so one other, now we can change it. 
one other uh, use that I'm sure you're aware of is peat has been used in gardening for many years and both as a sterile soil amendment to increase the retention and moisture, add humus to the soil. And it's also been molded into peat pots and liners for hanging baskets. Now my mother bought a bag of a bale of peat every year that she dug into her garden for growing tomatoes. Uh, so it's been used for years and years and years. So the advantages to peat is that it's sterile, so seedlings are less likely to be attacked by fungal wilts like damping off disease. Um, and like we said, it absorbs water. Now the disadvantage, is the main disadvantage is that Peat is not a renewable resource. It can never be harvested sustainably. So it, all, as it's mined, all the stored carbon is then released into the ecosystems. And the peat um, is not made fast enough to absorb enough of the carbon. The other disadvantages, actual disadvantages in the garden, is that once it dries out, it's hydrophobic. It means that it's hard, re hard, hard to re-wet, so the water just rolls off of it. I, I wrote a whole article on hydrophobic soils in my blog and greengardeningmatters.com, so if you are interested in what hydrophobic is, I, I wrote a whole article on that. And, of course, peat, as we talked about, is also acidic, and it has almost no nutrition available for the plants. And its acidity also inhi inhibits the growth of soil microbes. And in order to have a good garden with healthy plants, we need the soil ecosystem to be filled with soil microbes. So the peat actually inhibits the microbes that we need because the soil ecosystem uh, needs to be functioning so the soil can support the plant where it counts around the roots. And there's a whole complex exchanges of favors and, and between the roots and the microbes in the rhizosphere around the roots. So there are alternatives such as coconut core, which is made from coconut husks. And the, this is a waste product from something that's already been grown and harvested and used for something else. Now, core is neutral, it's not acidic, it offers the same kind of water retention qualities and some nutrients. Now, compost is also a good and highly renewable product that you can use to augment the humus in your soils. Now, at this point, if I was giving this to the cruise, the cruise people on a cruise, what I would say is if you have questions, talk to me later. And this is what I wanted to talk to them about. I wanted them to have at least one take home thing that they could apply in their own yards once they got off the cruise. But this is the segue into our headliners for the, the uh, presentation, which would be that in peat bogs have a low diversity because of the uh, low, and we can go to the next slide, the low uh, nutrients available. And so there are not very many plants, different types of plants that grow in the peat. You've got the sphagnum, you've got some other plants, but not very many. So when you look at a handful of peat moss, it looks like good rich soil, but it's not. It's sterile and it doesn't offer nutrients. So in a peat bog, most plants can't grow there. But even though plants don't have brains like we do, they have figured out how to get things done. So um, we'll go to our next slide. So plants that have evolved several strategies to grab their nutrients from critters and from the air and the water instead of the soil. And these are our carnivorous plants. And the there, there are three main methods for trapping insects, spiders, mites, and even small vertebrates like um, small fish or lizards. But with apologies to the entomologists and other zoologists, I will be using the term bug to refer to all these creeping and flying organisms.
So the pitchers, the pitcher plants, trap bugs in their liquid-filled pitchers, which are modified leaves. The sundews trap bugs on, with sticky glo globs on top of their hairs. And the bladder warts usually have underwater traps, bug larvae and frog and toad larvae and small fish under the water. So those are the three different strategies. Um, but so let's take a look at some of these plants and we'll begin with the pitcher plants. So if you go to the first, the, the first, the next slide, uh, the pitcher plants are all in the same genus, Saracinia. And actually one of our chapters of the Native Plant Society, the Saracinia chapter is in the panhandle of Florida. Um, but there are eight to 11 species, depending upon the, who, who you're talking to, how the taxonomists have divided it out. But all these picture plants, all the Saracinias are native to North America, um, including Florida. So the, um, the, um, the pitchers, if we go to the next slide, the pitchers are actually modified leaves with downward pointing hairs. And they're usually filled in this genus, these types of pitchers um, are filled with mostly rainwater. And bugs are attracted to these traps by odors and by nectar on the rim, on the lip. And when they fall in, they are then digested. And the plant is able to absorb the nitrogen, and phosphorus, and other nutrients from the leftovers of that. And then the nutrients are sent to the roots, and then they're used by the plant as if it had absorbed them from the soil. So if we go to the next slide, because unseen to our eyes, but you can see it in black light, there are special colors that the insects can detect um, and on the rim. And again, there is nectar on the rim as well. But things are a little more complex than that. If we go to the next slide, there are at least 165 species of insects, protozoa, algae, and other organisms that live in the pitcher water. And many of them are obligate um, inhabitants of pitchers. This is a pitcher plant mosquito. He can't, or she, she can't lay her eggs in just a puddle of water. She has to lay her eggs in the pitcher plant water. Um, and then the naiads, which would be the larvae, underwater larvae, uh, go to work on the bugs that would be uh, drowned in the, in the water there. Um, so all the waste and detritus from all of the organisms and this whole little ecosystem in the, in the pitcher, um, the, all the detritus falls to the bottom and the plant can absorb the uh, nutrients. But if we go to the next slide, what about their pollinators? How are they not consumed as well? Well, the pitcher plants and some other carnivorous plants have the flowers on, on high stalks and they emit a different odor. So the overlap between pollinator and prey is not very much overlap because it would not be advantageous to the plant to kill the pollinators. So there's one set of bugs that they eat and another set that are their pollinators. So um, it might seem that the modified leaves that form the pitchers uh, would be unique in the plant kingdom, but no. If we go to the next slide. My husband and I were on a hike and we saw the, the, this vine um, Filled with pitchers, it was a vine. So these are tropical pitcher plants. They're not related to the Saracidia. They're a different family. They have one genus with about 170 different species. So we found these in the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean. And, and I'd like to have you notice the close-up of one. There's a little grasshopper on, on the uh, 
coming up the the lip, I would hope that he would fly away or jump away and, and not fall to his his death. Now these pitcher plants though have lids that close when it rains and the plants themselves produce acidic chemicals that are released into the pitchers. So they do much more direct um, digestion of the plant, of, I mean, of the bugs, than the Saracenia, which is more passive. So that's another one. But wait, there's more. If we go to the next slide, there's yet another one. This is the Albany um, pitcher plant, and this is in south southwest Australia. And yes, it's pronounced Albany and not Albany. And we've been like in New York, and we've been there. Um, but I have to say, we didn't go looking for these pitcher plants. And if we get there again, uh, well, we may put this on our agenda. So these pitcher plants are again in a different family. There's only one species, and it's the only species in this family. And so what we have here is three different sets of unrelated plants that have created these wonderful modified leaves to capture prey so that they can absorb nutrients uh, from someplace other than the soil. And so when we have three different groups like this, or more than one group, that have evolved to the, do the same thing, we call this convergent evolution. Okay, so let's move on to the to the next group. If you move the sundews. There are about 190 different species of the sundews and and they're in their own family. And again, here is a typical sundew and what you find is that the flowers again carried up on a stalk so that the uh, pollinators are separated by the uh, space and again by odor and stuff from the insects and other bugs that are attracted to the um, traps and lures below. So if we go to the next slide. So the sundews are a little more active. Actually, they're a lot more active. And so what you have are glandular tentacles or trichomes. And when um, an insect or a bug lands on the surface of the plant, uh, the plant recognizes that and it will curve around so that the leaf becomes um, more and more of these little hairs would come in contact with the, with the bug so that he can't escape. And then as soon as the motion is triggered like that, then a different substance is then emitted, which is an acidic digestive juice. So instead of the sticky mucilage, which is the typical um, thing that causes the insects to come there, then this external, this leaf, this folded over leaf becomes a stomach, an external stomach, and it digests the, um, the, bu the bug right on the outside of the leaf. And there are glands on the surface of the leaf. If you go to the next slide, there are glands on the surface of the leaf that absorb the leftovers of the digestion. So we've got the mucilage, we've got the trichomes, we've got the, reg the regular mucilage to attract the uh, insects, and then there's a reservoir cell that will exude the digestive um, acidic uh, chemicals that would uh, digest the insect, and then the sessile gland would then absorb the nutrients. If we go to the next slide, the sundews have a wide distribution worldwide. Um, and the, the, again, there's 170 different plants. So there, there's, there's quite a variety of different plants. Um, but the, probably the most famous plant in the sundew family, um, if you go to the next slide, I'm sure you're familiar with this, is the Venus flytrap. All right, and the Venus flytrap is in the sundew family. And in the trap, it has trichomes that stick out 
of of the trap. And if more than one is excited by the bug, then the trap closes. So this is a very dynamic situation. Less than a second, it, the, the plant closes in on the bug. All right, so again, this is the, the more famous. If you go to the next slide, So again, the, the flowers, the flowers are high, different level in the ecosystem than the lures and the traps down below. But if you look at the range of the Venus flytrap, which is known around the world, the range is the Carolinas. That's it, just the Carolinas. So it's a very small range, but the plants are so magnificent that they have garnered worldwide attention. Okay. Now, the next plant in the sundew family is one you may not have heard of. It's called a water wheel plant. And I guess it's in the same family. It has traps below the, the level in the, in the water. And they're like the Venus flytrap traps, but they're faster and smaller. And so this would, they would be used to uh, uh, collect um, the aquatic uh, organisms down there. And so if you look at the next slide, the flower is held above the water. So the, this one has an easier time of keeping, keeping the pollinators and the prey separate because the pollinators are out of the water and the prey is under the water. Um, but if you look at their um, range, it's, it looks like it's been introduced to a couple of states in, in um, North America, but its native range is in Europe, Asia, Australia, and a couple of places in Africa. So this is the water wheel plant. Okay, so let's look at our third group of plants, which would be the bladder warts. All right, now if you look at the range of this, well, look at that range, it's just almost everywhere, not the Arabian Peninsula, not some of the, just a little line of space um, north of India that doesn't have it. Um, so the bladder warts have a huge range. And these are, are, are really uh, an interesting plant. They're mostly aquatic, um, but not all. There are about 200 species and there are 14 of, of uh, the utricularia that are native to Florida. Um, so 14 are in Florida. Um, okay, if we go to the next slide. All right, what we have here is that there are trigger hairs on the little traps on the underwater structures. They're not roots, they're underwater structures. And there's a little bladder and it's got the hair and when it's triggered, the lid pops open and the and the bladder expands so it, it creates a vacuum to go and it sucks in the prey as well as water and so that's how they absorb the the um, the prey in the aquatic environment all right if we go to the next slide there, since there's more than 200 species, there's quite a variety of the, of the bladder warts and, and they're just, I think they're beautiful uh, plants. Um, okay, but also in the bladder wart family, and we go to the next slide, are butter warts. And there are about 80 species of butter warts. Um, and again, you look at the at the range. It's most of the north, and um, but the greatest diversity of the butterworts is in Central and South America, which is kind of interesting. And they occur in fens and on rock surfaces, like the one that it's in the photo here, and in acidic peat bogs. And so there, there again, there's a number of different types. Uh, if we go to the next slide. What's interesting about the butterworts is that they trap insects like the sundews and the other family. So they've got the trichomes, they've got the, the mucilage, they've got the sessile 
uh, glands, and they absorb the the nutrients from the bugs, very similar to the sundews. But they're not a sundew because plants, as we know, are classified by the flowers, not the leaves. So it's an interesting uh, botanical uh, change where you had sort of a, a hybrid system here. Okay, and one last final member of the bladderwort family are the corkscrew plants. <clears throat> and the corkscrew plants have highly modified underground leaves to attract and trap and digest minute microfauna, particularly the protozoa. <coughs> they look like normal plants from above, but if you go to the next slide, They have no roots. <coughs> so what is under the ground or under the water are specialized stems and leaves that are little traps for soil organisms. All right, and you can see their range is from Central South America and over to Africa into Madagascar. <coughs> so Darwin thought that these were going to be carnivorous plants. But it wasn't proved until 100 years later that they were actually absorbing this, the microfauna in the soil. OK. All right, and speaking of Darwin, next slide. <coughs> ah, sorry. He, th he thought that the carnivorous plants that he found in his travels were so interesting and weird that he wrote a whole book about the ones that he found. He was particularly intrigued that the plants had found multiple methods of attracting and trapping prey. And Darwin wrote in his autobiography, and keep in mind all the things that Darwin figured out theory of evolution and all that, that of all the things that he found and discovered, that he wrote this, the fact that a plant should secrete when properly excited a fluid containing an acid and ferment closely analogous to the digestive fluid of an animal was certainly a remarkable discovery. So he thought it was his best discovery was figuring out carnivorous plants. He said that they were the most wonderful plants in the world. And I think a lot of us would agree with him on this. So after tens of millions of years of juggling hunger, the plants juggling hunger for nutrients and pollination for sexual reproduction, these wonderful plants have evolved into effective and selective killers. And they are mesmerizing. And they've continued to mesmerize people to this day. And we go to our last slide. Um, this was in Messina, Italy, which is on uh, Sicily. And we were in a garden. And um, these kids were so enthralled with the Venus flytrap, the most famous carnivorous plant that the docent was showing them, that they paid no attention to the geezer tourists that were taking their picture <laughs> right next to them. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour of peat bogs and their most famous residents, the carnivorous plants. And if you have questions, um, now would be a good time for that. That was a great presentation. Oh, That's thanks. Just awesome, folks. Uh, now is a good time to comment, question away. We'll be happy to take some of your questions live for Jenny if you have any particular, uh, you know, if you've been wondering about carnivorous plants. Uh, Jenny's excellent. She's worldly. She has traveled all over the world. 
Um, she can give you some interesting tidbits and fun facts that you had never considered. Um, and while I have Ginny, I would like to show you where you can get some of Ginny's books. So I pulled up the University Press of Florida, and this is actually her famous step-by-step -step guide to a Florida native yard. And yeah, now the University Press has a sale right now until June 30th. So you can get deep discounts on all of the uh, garden books that they would have brought to our conference. Um, so this is basically a virtual, uh, a, vir a virtual display. So all of yeah. my books, Craig Hugel's books, uh, Roger Hammer's books, all of these books are on sale at good discount right now. Um, and also, um, uh, Gil Nelson's book, The 200 Best Native Plants. I'd highly recommend that. It's not a cheap book, but it's cheaper now. <laughs> if you're just starting with native plants, the 200 best native plants for your yard. So now's a good opportunity. So you use, you use the code FNPS20, um, and then you get these deep discounts. Thank you for that, Mark. Right, we have a question from Aaron. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I'm just going to post it right here. Aaron B. Rosenfeld says, I've heard that there are specific water requirements to grow carnivorous plants regarding chlorination, acidity, et cetera. Can you explain a little bit on that? Well, what you have to do if they are plants from peat bogs, you have to replicate the peat environment. So that would mean high acidity which would be low pH, um, and no nutrients. And so um, probably best to get sphagnum moss. I am not an advocate of people growing their own plants, um, particularly because poaching is a problem on carnivorous plants. Um, I'd rather be out enjoying them uh, around the world. And yeah, there, there are specific things, and there's a lot on the internet to, to do that. But what you need to do, if it's a bog plant, you have to reproduce the bog conditions. Excellent point. And while we wait on some more questions, I'm going to uh, pull up your Green Gardening Matters uh, blog, because you just mentioned that you had written a new article on hydrophobic environments. Yes. So let's Google green gardening. So folks, this is how oh, you get yeah, just greengardeningmatters.com. That's it. Wonderful. Yeah, there you is. go. Okay. And that's what the website looks like. And yeah. you can All right. And and if you go to the if you go to the bottom of the books, there's a search. So if you if you look at hydrophobic. And dealing with hydrophobic soil. There you go. So, and, and I, I wrote I wrote that particularly. Uh, yeah. Um, so that that was a more recent one. We we were traveling and when we came back in March, uh, the oxalis had taken over all the beds that I had carefully mulched. So, <laughs> um, but the one that you want to read is the one above that. Um, um, is the hydro de dealing with hydrophobic soils. And it's particularly important when you're growing seedlings because while the surface of the soil looks wet, just under the surface it's not. And this is because water is attracted to itself and doesn't want to go into that dry soil. So there are ways that you can address that and that's what I talk about in that article. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for it takes a labor of love to put a blog as comprehensive as yours. Uh, and, you know, it does not well, go in. It, it's, it's been fun. And, um, you know, I know cruising, cruising has gotten a bad name recently. Um, and we were on a cruise ship at the beginning of the year. Um, we were actually had two back-to-back -back assignments. So, we missed our last two ports because we had to get our guests back to Florida before March 20th so that they could fly home to Europe or uh, Australia or whatever. But I love talking to the cruisers because it's another audience that um, 
may be unlikely to join the native plant society. So if I can change their mind about lawn poisoning or not using peat moss or something like that. So I always have something that they can bring home. And it's, it's very rewarding because they'll be sitting there at the pool deck working on my next presentation and people will come up to me and they say, oh my God, Jenny, I, I've learned so much science. I should have majored in biology when I was in school. This is so fascinating. What I don't tell them is that if they'd majored in biology, they would have been bit boring. They'd have to memorize the Calvin cycle. They would have all kinds of things that, no, it's interesting because I have cherry picked this just for you <laughs> so that you will say, oh my gosh, I never knew that. Right. So, well, thank so you for cherry picking to put for those us. together. It's fun to put them together. I have more than 20 cruise presentations now. And so I'm ready to go. So my assignment for the summer that's canceled was to the second half of the voyage of the vikings which is a round trip from boston so we would have been going from amsterdam to boston um and iceland oh my gosh iceland is just fantastic um but that's what i was that's what i created this for and i needed the headliner of the carnivorous plants but of course oh, once awesome. Once I started doing the research on the carnivorous plants, I said, wow, this is just amazing. <laughs> um, and and uh, the other assignment that I had in the fall was um, a leg of the Grand Africa voyage. And so that would have started in Monte Carlo in Morocco, gone through the Mediterranean Sea, through the Suez Canal and down to the Seychelles Islands where we could look at those pitcher plants again. Um, and so we'd have to decide whether we would stay for the rest of the way around Africa as passengers or whether we'd fly home from the Seychelles, which seems onerous. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to do the presentations. And so I have presentations for the Mediterranean, like, how the Mediterranean was formed and stuff. Very interesting. So Very at, cool. at my age, if I can stimulate my own brain, <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. No, it's, it's fascinating. And um, we really thank you for putting together a presentation that we can glean from some of these experiences because some of us have very busy lives. We would never visit the Seychelles so no, I mean you've got to work. I'm retired, so you know we can do this stuff. We're seeing these fascinating places through your eyes, and thanks so much. And I've pulled up the Florida Native Plant Society website here. Yes, please join people. us. Please join us. There, yes, Very and there is the join and renew, and the resources is the famous Palmetto magazine. And you won't be able to see the latest version of the Palmetto, but Ginny, if you'd like to touch base on that fabulous article that was just recently published uh, while yeah. we have you on live stream. Yeah, if you join the Native Plant Society now, th this is the palmetto that you would get. I just happen to have it here, let me see. Um, it's got Roger Hammer's passion flowers on the cover, isn't that beautiful? But I talked about, actually did two articles. I talked about rethinking urban trees and how we need to rethink um, what we do in urban trees. And I ended up talking about a, a bioswale in Jacksonville. And I ended up also doing a um, profile of wax myrtles, um, which is a really good tree to put in your yard. It's so adaptive and it fixes nitrogen at twice the rate of a legume. So it has nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria, but it's not the rhizobium that the legumes yeah. use. It's an, it's an actinomycetes. So it can grow a lousy soil. It can grow wet soil. It can grow dry soil. It's evergreen. It produces berries for the birds through the winter. Um, mm -hmm. It's a good screen. Easy, easy, easy to grow. So I did a plant profile as well. So if you join the Native Plant Society today, you will get this issue. And there's also an uh, article in here by Craig Hugel on, on meadows so that you can learn how to uh, do meadows and grasses that um, would be good for for a meadow. So our Parmetto, our Parmetto magazines are put together by Marjorie Shropshire, um, but 
they have really interesting articles. Some are heavy science, some are, some are stuff that you can use right now. So all kinds of stuff. So please join us and you'll get that. Yeah. Yeah, Megan, if you are uh, a member, you can read all about that in the latest Palmetto publication. Um, and if you go online, you can research some of the older archive Palmettos. And those are really interesting. Personally, I find those rich in our Florida Native Plant Society history. This year, we're celebrating 40 years. 40 years. As an organization. So we've been around we've been around the block for a while now. So uh, yeah. Right. There are, there's a wonderful resources on the website. The plant finders. There's um, information about our various ecosystems and that kind of thing. So um, they're just a wonderful resource. Now, you don't have to be a member to use the, these resources, but wouldn't you like to support it? Exactly. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, this wraps things up. We've uh, gone a little bit over an hour, but we've had fun. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. And folks, we'll see you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye.